lessons learned on agile projects from a tester's perspective. So when I'm talking today, it's things that from, from testing, because you can, you know, do it from a product owners or a developer or anybody else, but we're going to talk about from a testing perspective. And do you hate that? Froze. There we go, just slow. Oops. Let's try this again. Impatient. Uh, hey, that was weird. This is what ha I've had this problem before, and I've never figured it out. <coughs> so we're going to just pull it up. That's my grandson. Can't you see him at 16? <laughs> okay, cross your fingers. All right, magic. I've been a programmer many years ago, too many, um, and then I went into quality assurance. I was a QA manager in a very traditional environment. My first agile project, I went in as a tester. And I heard Jonathan talk about um, being challenged this morning saying, on Agile projects, on an XP project, we don't need testers. That was very much my experience on my first Agile team, too. But I dug in and never been sorry. Testing on an Agile project is way more fun. So now, you know, my life is dedicated to, to, to teaching that funness to other people. Since then, I've been doing, um, actually since the book came out, I've been doing much more consulting and training versus actually embedded as a tester or a coach on a team. And it's a little bit different and I haven't quite decided whether I like it. I miss the hands-on testing and I haven't had it for a little over a year. So I'm thinking that it's time for me to go get a project where I'm testing again and get hands-on because it's a lot of fun. But I do coaching and training and I do learning. I mentioned that conference, the Much Ado About um, Agile here. Go to the conferences, learn from other people. Every time I talk to somebody, I learn something. So I really challenge people to keep doing that as well. So from this session, I'm going to talk, and I hate standing up here talking, so I'm going to encourage questions along the way too. I'm going to talk very briefly about symptoms versus problems, and I'm going to talk about four different lessons learned. Um, and each of them I'm going to talk about the problem first, and then about how to recognize it. What are the real symptoms? And then hopefully give you some practical ideas that you can take away if you happen to be seeing those problems in your organization. But first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Agile means to me. It's one slide. Um, this is a kind of an Agile testing conference. How many people are actually practicing um, some form of what they would consider Agile? <coughs> Perfect. How many really don't know and they're just here to learn, aren't practicing and, and learning? A few. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail, so I hope it's enough to give you a good idea. To me, Agile is just a term to describe different methodologies, um, XP, Scrum, DSDM, Crystal, there's quite a few different ones out there, but they all practice iterative and incremental development. We encourage active participation of the customer. So the customer you'll hear in Scrum being a product owner, but somebody representing the customer. And active participation is key. It's not a throw it over the wall kind of idea. They've got to be working with the team. Whole team collaboration. So part of 
the testers sitting with the developers is so that you can be part of the whole team, the whole team being the project team. Um, and from a testing perspective, each, each uh, story or feature, whatever you want to call it, is tested in, within that iteration. So it's coded and tested kind of all at the same time, not left till the end. The key to Agile is delivering business value at regular intervals. Uh, so I don't care if that's every two weeks, um, if I'm delivering, if my iterations are two weeks, but I'm not delivering to the customer for three months. If I'm doing it regularly, that's what's important. Um, I was just at a conference in Romania weekend before last. Very, very cool conference, much like the Vancouver one here. But there was um, a couple of people that had been doing, and they were actually putting into production 59 times a day. They were deploying to production. So every time they'd make a little change, they'd get it tested and they'd put it out to production. Now, know your context. Very, very few people can do that. Very few companies can do that. You'd have to be pretty special. The other thing is adapting your processes. It's about continuous improvements. Everybody here is testers. That's what we learn, continuous improvement. Agile enables us to do that. So, you know, pretty simple, common sense in my mind. But how hard is it? Well, turns out that it's actually pretty hard. One of the things that I find people doing time after time after time is we have this, these retrospectives. I'm going to tip this over. We have these retrospectives, very key. That's what kind of drives our process improvement. But we identify symptoms. And then we solve those symptoms. Our stand-ups are too long. Oh, let's cut our team in half. Or something along that line. Without sitting there thinking about what is the problem behind that symptom. So using like the five whys that Lean talks about. Really find the root cause and understand the problem. Really, really important. I knew a team that solved, took them two years to solve their problem of their uh, stand-ups being too long and ineffective, had nothing to do with the team or the length of time. It was how they were dividing up the stories and being able to talk about them. So really think about what the problem is underneath. So lesson number one we're going to talk about. Get involved early and, then, and really, really stay involved. Testers cannot stand on the sidelines. You really have to be part of that team. So the problem, if you're not involved, if you're part of a separate test team and you're coming in and just testing, is that we end up with these, quite often, these mini waterfalls. So all it does is become truly a mini waterfall. The developers are coding um, and end up in a code and fix cycle at the end because you're not in there testing as soon as it's being completed coding. You know, if, you're, if your testing is at the end of the iteration, if your stories, um, so if I'm in a two-week iteration and I don't start testing till day eight, I'm not getting feedback to those developers fast enough. They're not going to be able to fix the bugs. And we're just going to get into this cycle that's really, really hard to get out of. So some of the symptoms that you're going to see are things like um, vocabulary. I'm big on vocabulary. So listen to the vocabulary running around your team. You're sitting with the developers, but you're still hearing those us versus them kind of vocabulary. Yeah, the testers haven't started testing it yet. You know, just really, really think about it. Is it a little mini waterfall? Are they throwing it over the wall? The wall's just smaller? You can be talking about customers and talking about them. 
instead of being as part of the team. So really watch your vocabulary, listen to it. Um, as a tester, I've walked, or as, as a coach, I've walked into teams and I'll be hearing this conversation happening and they'll go, yeah, we're waiting for the developers to finish coding. Not quite sure what that story is going to look like. I don't know how to test it. If you don't know what you're testing, if you do not know and you do not know what's coming down and you're not expecting, or you don't know what to expect, it's a symptom. You're testing tasks. So how many people have storyboards, physical storyboards that they move their piece of paper over? Yeah, a few. But quite a few have electronic ones. Yeah. I like, I understand the reason for the electronic ones, especially if you have a distributed team. There's something about moving those story cards over those task cards that's really, you know, kind of neat. And the, one of the things that I like best is it's really easy to see. Oh, look, those testing tasks, they haven't moved. How come they're not moving? We're on day nine of our iteration. None of them are moved. They're red flags. Bug fixing, another symptom. If you've got a hardening sprint, we'll fix those bugs later. Really think about that because later means Oh, three iterations later if you've got a hardening sprint. But they're harder to fix later. So these are all symptoms. How many have defined done, done? Or done, done, done? Come on, I know the teams are out there. It's a symptom. If I hear done, done versus just done, in my mind it's a symptom that testing isn't being done right away. There's different ways to do it. Some teams say done, done means, you know, we've got these other integration tests that we have to do, so we have to do that. Uh, I'd rather see an extra story or task to deal with that, you know? Done means I'm done this developing, I'm done testing, this story is done. I'm quite adamant about that. Yeah. So some of the things you can try if you're seeing these kinds of symptoms, from a testing perspective, it's really, really hard to be a good tester if you're following behind. Because one of our jobs is to give feedback. If I'm testing an iteration behind, my feedback is falling on deaf ears. Developers aren't going to want to stop and fix the bugs. So really think about that whole team approach. Remember on my, when I was talking about Agile, I really said, you know, whole team approach. So really push it. Really, really understand that that whole team and the whole team is your project team. I'm a tester on this team. There are developers. There's a product owner, customer. Sometimes there's business analysts. Sometimes there's DBAs. What is it? that's on your, who is on your team. Um, but that whole team is committed to quality. As a tester, it is not my job to ensure quality. It's my job to give information, to give feedback so people can make informed decisions about the level of quality. If the whole team solves the problems, so if I've got a problem that I can't test because my test environment's not up, it's not necessarily my problem. It's the whole team's problem. And if the whole team has to stop and solve it, then that's what it is. That's what has to happen. Testers, I said at the very beginning, have to be involved early and stay involved. So if you're not in the planning sessions, whether it's a release planning session an iteration planning session, even a whiteboard design session. Invite yourself. Understand what's going on. It'll make you better testers because you know what to expect. You can think of all those things that Jonathan was talking about this morning. If you don't understand the stories or the big picture, you can't even start to think about them because it does move fast and you get rolling and it's really easy to get lost. So if my iteration is two weeks and I've still got testing tasks towards the end, you know, what's the whole team going to do about it? 
you know, let somebody else pick up a testing task. Something else that I found very powerful is the power of three. Now, sometimes it can be four or whatever, but a domain expert, a testing representative, and a developer representative, anytime you go to talk about a story, really think about those perspectives. Because if that story changes slightly and you don't have that tester, they're going to lose something or they're not going to be able to ask that really important question like, gee, what happens if, if you change that, that impacts this whole other thing. That's really good at is asking questions. So really, you know, think about the power of three. We put that in as a rule because in one place that I was at, we had a, we had a problem. I brought it up as a in a retrospective and I said, you know, these stories, you guys are changing them, the developer and the customer. And we go to test them and it's been changed. What are we going to do about it? So we talked about it, solved it as a whole team, came up with this rule. Nobody could talk about a story unless there was three people. So what it allowed us to do was every time I saw a developer and a customer standing over there by the whiteboard, see my whiteboard over there, no, no, just kidding. Um, and I saw them going up, it gave me the right to go up and say, are you talking about a story? Should I be here? Because it was a team decision, we chose to solve that problem. Little rules like that can be very powerful. From a testing perspective, you want to be adding value. If I'm always, um, if I can't come in with a solution or another idea, um, if I'm not giving what the developers need, I might not be adding value. And I want to question myself, what am I doing here? You want those developers to be able to say, we can't do this without Janet or without Michael, whoever the testing is. You want to be adding value. Acceptance test-driven development. You guys have all heard of TDD, test-driven development. It's what the developers do. Think about acceptance test-driven development. Defining your acceptance test up front, coding to that. Take it a step higher. If you've got a feature and you've got multiple stories, Jonathan this morning talked about losing um, the big picture. He called it something else, but it's what I call it is losing the big picture. A real, uh, it happens in Agile, and it's one of the pitfalls, is we start testing those stories and forget that they make up a feature. You know, a feature has many stories. Define acceptance tests for the feature level as well. That'll help you remember the big picture. But acceptance test-driven development is, you know, let's give the tests up front. We have a clearly defined um, goal, if nothing, for lack of a better word. But being able to give those tests to the developers early, at a high level and at a lower level. All of my automation, if I can give them the acceptance test or the rest of the tests early, whether they're automated or manual or a set of variations I'm going to test, it will help them code to the right thing. They're going to code it right. means fewer bugs for me to find. And then I can really spend up my time doing exploratory testing which is what we're good at. So try breaking up your stories smaller, less than three days. Kind of my rule of thumb. I want to be testing within three days of my iteration starting. Now, there's a whole lot more to it than that. If they're not testable stories, doesn't help me. If it says something about create database tables, doesn't help me. I want a vertical slice, a testable story something that I can test. So you think about feature teams versus component teams. I don't want a database team and a GUI team and something else. I want a feature team. Any questions about that lesson? It's, it's really important. Um, be involved early, often, and continuously. Everybody is? You guys are all sitting quietly, no questions. Common sense, everybody agrees. Anybody practicing mini waterfall? 
How many people have hardening sprints? Iterations? Yeah, a few. People don't want to say it now, I know. So really think about it. You know, some, now I have to say that sometimes I've talked to people that say, we've got many waterfall and we're delivering on a regular basis and our customers are happy and we're doing it all, it's fine. And I said, cool. If it's not causing you any issues and you are delivering and you're getting your bugs fixed and everything, I'm not gonna say it's wrong. But in my experience, is what happens is we're not testing as much as we could and the bugs aren't being fixed when they should be, which is right up front. Because we want to shorten that feedback cycle. Um, lean. Feedback cycle short. <laughs> no questions. So we'll go on to number two. Oh, yes. What would you call it if you do like lean development, but then at the very end, so maybe you do lean development for six months, but then before you have to deliver the feature, you have like six weeks or something of, of oh. testing? So I would have to ask why. I mean, we all have an end game. Um, and I, I call it an end game because if we call it something else like system testing, there's more to it. There's sometimes you have to do something at the end because you have a huge integration issue. If you've got a big application, there's some kind of testing you kind of have to do at the end because I'm in a staging environment and the only place I can actually test my Visa card application is in that staging environment. So there are some kinds that you can only do at the end. But really question about what are we doing and what is the purpose of it? Uh, why is it taking us six weeks? So I mean, I was in um, a uh, team one time when we first went in, and our quality kind of wasn't very good. Our first end game was four months. That's how long it took the customer to accept the product. It was too long. So we, we started doing our automation and a bunch of other things to improve it. Our next end game was two months. We finally got it down so that our end game was two weeks. We could not get it any shorter because one of the requirements was it had to prove that it was up for two weeks straight, 24 seven. It was a reliability test. That was as short as we could get our end game. But everything else we could get in, including our user acceptance test in that two weeks. So really think about what it is you're trying to do. Um, for the people that are doing that 59 times a day kind of, their end game's two minutes. Did we run our tests? Did you check this? Yes, go. So really, really understand what you're trying to do in that last six weeks. But every team's gonna have something different. Okay, lesson number two. It's something we forget. So really learn your business domain. Because part of it is being able to give feedback to your customer. They're new too, a lot of times. So the problem, if you are not understanding your business domain as a team, and testers tend to understand it a little bit better than developers because we are at a higher level. But if you're guessing at those imp that implementation and going, yeah, I think this is how they want it, or you find that you're taking longer, you know, to get it right, really think about it. What can you do to try to understand, to help the customer get it right so you don't have to redo it? So some of the symptoms that you're gonna see. In my perfect agile world, the one metric worth measuring is how many bugs escape to production. If I've got zero tolerance bugs all the way through, those are the only, that's the only defect metric I really care about. But if you've got those bugs in, into production, look at them. Find out what kind of bugs they are. If they're truly requirements bugs and not you know, software issues, coding mistakes. It says that somebody's not understanding that business domain. Now, I'm gonna guess that the customers, your product owners, they probably know the domain. I'm hoping they know the domain. 
But as testers, if we learn that as well, we can ask questions. We can ask those really good questions in those planning sessions to try to get rid of those bugs. Because that's what we want to do is we want to focus on preventive, preventative uh, measures. Let's get rid of those kinds of bugs up front in our planning sessions. Release planning, um, iteration planning, design sessions. So really look for them. You know, are they, are they really, you know, data issues or human errors because they're making mistakes. If somebody makes a mistake, it means that we didn't understand their problem well enough. So one of the suggestions that um, has been really successful is, you know, so don't only learn new testing techniques. Don't only learn new, you know, how to do better automation. You know, take a piece of that business. You know, I really want to understand that report because it's been bugging us forever. What are they using this report for? How are they using it? What are we trying to do with it? Understand what the users, what the customers are doing with it. How are they using it? And I mentioned this before, working with a, the giving acceptance tests at a feature level. Take the time to draw flow diagrams. Make your customer walk through and say, yeah, this is how I picture this to work. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. This is the problem I'm trying to solve. Don't just sit back and, and um, think about testing it. What can you do to ask questions to make them understand um, the need so that the whole team understands? Now, one of the most powerful questions you can ask is what customer, or asking what problem are we trying to solve? How many of you have actually uh, had a customer say, yeah, we want to come in and we want to do um, this, and they're telling you how to solve the problem. They're saying, can you do it this way? And you go, yeah. And then when you go to deliver it, they go, well, that's not really solving my problem. So learn to ask those questions up front, because I firmly believe that as testers, one of the things we can do is help them clarify what they're trying to, what they really want. Meeting and exceeding customers' expectations, whether they want us to or not. We want to understand their problem because part of our responsibility as an agile development team is to help that customer have good software. Yep. Questions? You guys are wait. I know this is the worst time slot because you just had all this lunch, no coffee. Questions? You guys are way too quiet. I'm going to go back to the round tables. No questions. Ah. I gave this presentation in Romania and I had all kinds of questions. You guys are slackers. I'll, I'll ask one. So if you're involving the customers a lot yes. in your testing process, won't that uh, slow down the testing sometimes because you're going back and forth? Okay, so the question is, if we involve the customers, won't it slow down the testing? Yes. Short answer is yes. But what it does do is it prevents us from redoing it again. So in the long term, you know that short term pain for long term gain kind of thing? It really adds up. So if we spend the time to involve the customers, and we spend the time trying to understand their problem, we're actually going to do a better job. So one of the things in Agile we recognize is the fact that customers don't know what they want. They just don't, till they see it. So if we can give them shorter feedback cycles, like say, you know, um, this is a problem you're trying to solve. Here's a mock-up, for example. What do you think? Really easy for them to scribble and say, no, that's not what I meant. So the time you've spent on that really will save at the end. Um, a little short story, my husband has been listening to me talk about Agile, and he's not in software. He's in sales, chemical sales, oil and gas, as far away from software as you can. But he's been listening to me, and so his, he's been trying to get 
a SharePoint site up for four months. Been talking to a developer, going back and forth and back and forth. And finally he says, okay, you know what, I'm coming down to Houston. I'm booking this morning. You and I are sitting together. Four hours of him sitting there going, can we do this? Yep, and him doing it. Four hours they had his SharePoint site up because sitting with the customer, understanding what they want, what they're looking for, can make all the difference in the world. Sorry. Yep. Oh. Don't be sorry. So, uh, is it a little different than uh, uh, sitting down with the customer doing the testing this? Because that's like, if I'm doing the requirements and I'm sitting down with the customers and we're figuring out with the mockups and everything mm -hmm. what we want, we agree, sign on the paper, then start the testing process. Like, how's, which one is more beneficial? Okay, so one of the things you said there uh, caused me a red flag. Um, sitting with mock-ups, so we're asking whether or not sitting with a customer afterwards, testing, or spending the time up front doing mock-ups and getting a signature sign-off. Either doing requirements or doing testing phase. So, show of hands. Um, I'm going to ask a question, so I want uh, an either or. Do you think, I'm going to, this is putting it out to the client, do you think it's better to spend the time with the re customer during requirements or during testing? So, how many during uh, requirements? How many during testing? So, both? Both. Both. So, what we're trying to do is different reasons. So, I'm not going into it today, but one of the things I talk about in the book is the agile testing quadrants. The purpose of tests. Are we doing it to support the team, to help understand what we're supposed to build, or critiquing the product? Right? So if we're showing the mock-ups and working with them to understand their problem space, we're trying to support the team, which is trying to build it right. If we're spending time with them afterwards, it's critiquing the product and we're trying to understand what, what they're seeing and get their feedback. So there's two different purposes. So yeah, so I think both actually. Question. What if the clients are firewalled from the testing uh, either technical support people are the only ones who are allowed to talk to them, or business analysts are the only ones who are allowed to talk to them. Yeah, so if the, the customers are, are firewalled, I like that phrase, um, there, it can be a problem. So whoever your customer surrogate is that's working with you, hopefully they have access to the customers and things. Um, so it le it's one layer of abstraction and it makes our job a lot harder. Now one of the biggest pitfalls, like remember I talked about the whole team at the very beginning, if your organizational structure or your organizational culture is standing in the way, and that's one of the, it's a big issue because it's saying that our organization isn't understanding what we're trying to do. Um, and so it can be a very big problem. And yeah, all you can do is hope that, that your customer um, surrogate really knows what they're doing and has access to those customers. And help them, help them as much as you can to ask the right questions. Have you ever had to do, I guess, on behalf of your customer, right? Did you want a, a customer involved for requirements to test through the entire, the entire process, basically? Yep. And they say, well, I've got a day job and I can't be involved in this. Then you say, well, it's going to enhance the quality of the product we produce. We're going to nail it you know, more accurately the things you, you're asking us to build. And it will be of you to supply this person so that we can get it right the first time. And it will be less expensive than higher quality. Have yeah. you had to go down the path of saying like a cost-benefit analysis to prove to anybody where that line is? Um, I haven't actually done that cost-benefit analysis. But anytime I hear, when you start saying, you know, it'll be cheaper, faster, um, think about the cost benefit, right? So the other way of doing it, um, and I call it um, using the train wreck, we all have train wrecks in our software. Some are bigger, some are smaller. So the first time something goes out into production that you miss the requirement big time, right? You put it out and you got it wrong. Use that train wreck 
as a because that then you can get tangible um, costs on it. You put it out and you go, yeah, that didn't work so well. How much did it cost us to redo that? Um, so try to find some of those nuggets, and then it's really easy to do a cost-benefit analysis on something that's real, rather than using um, folklore, as, as Jonathan called it this morning, things that, um, you know, yeah, you know, this costs us money every time we put it out. Grab something that you can put a number onto and use it, because we all have those train wrecks. It's going to be a bit of a, you know, like, not negotiation, but you have to, Say it's a new customer, you're trying to get them on board. And, and uh, basically, you need that for your business. Yeah. So, you want to not share all your dream reps right up front. No, no, this right. is true. <laughs> but you want to be able to talk about experience and somehow provide, you know, in order to make a cultural shift, perhaps, yeah. from the customer side, to make it a so, yeah. that will allow them to free up that person. Right. So if you can find a, uh, a few articles that support some of those things, those are some of the best things you can do. Um, but explaining what they get out of it. Everybody wants to know what's in it for them. And so if, if they're a new customer, you know, you go back and you say, so the last time you put out an application and the development team that you were working with, did you get exactly what you wanted? You know, just ask some open-ended questions. Get them talking and understand what their issues are, what their problems are, what have they been trying to solve, and address those issues. So you may not be able to do it in dollars and cents, but say, this is how this will help solve that problem. OK. S lesson number three. I used to say it is impossible to do an agile team, um, an agile project without automated tests, without automated regression tests. And I've, you know, toned that back and I put almost impossible. Now, because you can, I can keep putting more testers on or I can run six, six week iter um, end games. I can do different things. But if you want to be keeping up with a potentially shippable product at the end of every iteration. Um, and when I say iterations, I'm thinking two weeks, because that's just my favorite. Worked in four week iterations, I've worked in one week iterations. Um, but if I want a potentially shippable product, which means that if the customer said, you know what, this has enough value, let's put it out, that I would be able to say, you know, I'm happy with it. It means that my regression tests have been run every iteration. And if you're trying to do them manually, it's really, really difficult. There's no safety net. When I want, what I want my automated regression tests to do is automation is a safety check. It just checks for side effects. It's not going to find any new bugs because it's doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's repeatable, it doesn't change, so it's not going to find any new and cool bugs. But it is going to tell me if I change something unexpectedly. That's my safety net. Now, I walked into a company one time and these guys have been doing Agile for two years. They were good at it. They were a success. They've given lots of presentations on their success. And I walked in and I'm going, there because their unit tests were running all the time. And they had this really nice big suite of kind of fit-like tests. But I went in and I'm you know, going, uh, but these aren't all passing. Their unit tests were all passing. But their regression tests, their functional tests, weren't passing all the time. And they go, yeah, no, we know that. Um, we fix them at the end. They're kind of releasing every three months internally. And we spend the last couple of weeks fixing all those tests. And I went, whoa, whoa, hey, red flag, guys. How do you know that you're, you didn't have a bug in there buried? What's going on? I couldn't convince them to fix those tests. And it just kept going down and down, and I was keeping track. And after about, um, was there about a month, and I'm, I was just, it was driving me crazy. 
And sure enough, they fixed all the tests. And I said, but do you really know that there wasn't other bugs buried in these and different things? It's driving me crazy. So the next thing, the next, um, when we started the new three-month cycle, we had all of these 100% tests passing on the very first day. And um, I brought it up as part, of the, the, as part of the retrospective, and I said, this is a problem for me. So they agreed to keep those tests passing at 98%, because they were pretty complex tests, and it was really hard to have 100% passing every day. What we found was, guess what? There were a lot of bugs that they were missing. And as we fixed them and made sure that the tests were passing or found the bugs and fixed the bugs, we had a higher rate of um, confidence from the domain experts that were part of our team. It had a ton of side effects, but we were able to run those regression tests every day. They ran all night, but we had confidence that it was still building and we had a potentially shippable product. So if, you're, if you can't run your regression tests every day, or at least every iteration. Really think about why and why not and what you can do about it. So you do a test and retest, got a bug, but you want to, you know, I know this bug was in there and I tested it, but I, you know, I'm not sure that it didn't creep back in again, so I've got to retest it again and again. You guys ever do that? No. Yeah, some. If your bugs are coming back in, so that's why you're retesting all the time. Really think about why, because you can't do a successful manual test every iteration unless you have the whole team do it every time. And the biggest one is you don't get a chance to do your exploratory testing. And that's where you're going to find your cool bugs, because automation doesn't get that stuff. So you really, really need to be able to have time to do that. So think about, um, this is the uh, automation test pyramid. Uh, Mike Cohn, oh, lost my little piece of, uh, Mike, it's Mike Cohn that had uh, first talked about this. And if we have an automated regression test, my base of this pyramid belongs to the developers. It's a big part of my regression suite. Their automated tests, unit tests running every time they check in. So continuous integration, I haven't even talked about that. Does everybody know what continuous integration is? Building constantly. Everybody has it, right? Yes! Number one thing in Agile. If you haven't got continuous integration as a tester, you're not going to be able to take any build that you want to test. Make sure you have continuous integration. So every time those developers check in, their code runs, their unit tests run, and they pass. That gives me a, a degree of confidence that what I'm going to take to test is already there. It's the base of my regression tests. Include it. It's part of it. Um, the API level tests. Test under the GUI. Lots and lots of tools out there that allow you to collaborate with the developers up front, to define your automation up front, to help them, so that when the story is finished being developed, your automated tests are already running and passing. All I have to do is my exploratory testing and maybe some automation on the GUI afterwards. We want the testers and developers to collaborate. So if the tools are chosen so that the developers can work with you, you're going to get a better set of regression tests because they're going to be helping you. So it's things you can do to, to work at it. Oh. Any questions on this? I go to a quarter after, right? OK. An example of an tests um, she asked if I have an example of an uh, acceptance level API tool. I'm going to say it depends. I'm not going to recommend any because it really depends on your application, 
your, the context that you're trying to do. But an example of one that's a collaborative one is fit. Um, or fitness, if you want to use the wiki. But there's other things like cucumber now and, and a lot of robot. There's a ton of them out there. Um, but one size does not fit all. So you don't really think about it. But there's lots of new tools out there. Any other questions? Automation. Everybody's automating their regression tests. Question mark. Um, and the relatively small compared. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, and I didn't really talk about that too much, did I? I ignored it. Um, so the GUI tests, or UI tests, and I, I'm going to take the G off of there. I've, I was at a team last week, and I thought, yeah, you know what, I'm going to change this and adapt it a little bit, because not all applications have a graphical user interface. Sometimes you have a voice type of thing. Um, so it, it's a little bit, but the GUI, if you've got a graphical user interface, the automation is tiny. I don't want to be doing all my automation through it because it's brittle. It changes. So in my mind, um, if I'm using a, a tool like Ruby with water, I will um, keep my GUI tests to be things like, um, Oh gee, all the, uh, we tested all the tab order. I can automate that to make sure that that never gets messed up. My tab order is correct. I might automate it to say, does this button actually hit the delete function? Did it go to the right page? End of test. Because I've tested the delete function with my API level tests. I don't need to test that again. So it truly is only at the UI level. I might have a few really important workflow tests that do go from top to bottom and all the way through. But I do not want that to be the majority of my tests because those are the ones that break. And it's really hard to keep them running green. So the reason we talk about going at the API level is because they're not brittle. They, keep, they are far more maintainable. Um, I can tell you what the purpose is of each and every test really easily. So we, the whole idea behind this pyramid is to keep maintainable tests. The lowest, the highest return on investment is the unit tests because the developers are maintaining them. Question? Is it yeah. possible that if you don't automate from the UI, then you'll actually um, miss a lot of bugs that could be like events and things like that? Um, so. Uh, if we don't go through the UI, well, we miss a lot of events and things like that, right? Yeah. Now, when I talked to developers, I said, from a testing point of view, the worst thing that has happened in the last few years is JavaScript. Because all of a sudden, they're forcing us to test at the UI level again. And so, from an automation perspective, it's, yes, it's pushed the testing back up to the UI layer. So, if you've got a lot of JavaScript up there, you have to figure out a way to do it, and yes. Um, so we've got to retrain those developers to push that business logic back down <laughs> from a testing perspective. But yeah, it's something we're going to have to deal with, and I'm going to guess the testing tools are going to have to keep up with it. And some of the open source ones aren't bad, but yeah, it's hard. But yes, good, good point. But you want to keep it up as high as possible. The functional, the stuff that you can test below that, AP, the business stuff, do as much as you can below it. Any other questions? Okay. So the last lesson, and this is a little more subtle, but I've seen it over and over and over again, is we've got this agile team. And we've been, we've been at it. It's been around now long enough that we've had teams doing it for five, ten years. And we get complacent. And we forget some of the, the, the real good lessons that we have. We start creeping in and we start doing more JavaScript and we start putting more stuff in and we start, and we forget to, to do things like um, maintain our tests. Now, the flip side on that, 
especially for new teens, is we panic. Because we've got this, um, we've been doing this every two weeks, and then all of a sudden somebody comes in and goes, we have to release, you've got to get all this stuff done, and we forget everything that we've been trying to do. And we just all start testing like mad, or something. We start recording all that testing, and we just start going at it. It's really easy to panic and start doing things. And you'll see it on teams. You know, when those old habits, when you know that you thought you had, you know, didn't do that anymore, but you find yourself doing it again. Or, you know, somebody new comes into the team and they go, so I noticed that um, we don't seem to have enough requirements anymore and we're not understanding this story. Let's document some more. Can we add more stuff into that story so that we know what it's doing? Really watch those kinds of things because it's really easy to slip back into that. All of a sudden, your stories go from being you know, a one-liner with an acceptance test or two or three, and then the conversation behind it to somebody sitting there and going and documenting that whole requirement and giving use cases and you forget to talk. Your tests, they need refactoring. If they're taking longer and longer and longer, you gotta go back. Developers want refactoring, you have to too. So if your tests, when, you're, when you've got a new story coming up, you know, one of the things you're thinking about is always, do we need to refactor the existing tests? Put that into your time. Or as I mentioned in that other story, forgetting to run your test screen. We expect the developers to have their unit tests running green all the time. As testers, can we expect anything less from us? So if, we're made, if, we've, if we've got responsibility for you know, those functional tests, those API tests, um, and working with the developers, they need to be running green each time too. Same with the UI tests. Whatever there is out there that you're responsible for, they need to run green. So one of the biggest helpful things that I can do is, you know, big visible charts. You'll hear me say that. Whatever you're trying to change, find some way to measure it. Put it up on the wall. Make people aware of it. The simpler it is, the easier it is to see. So if you've got your, your tests and they're going downhill, that was all what I had to do is I had to show them that we were going from 98% passing to 60% passing to 40% passing. That kind of a downward trend is very, very visible and very opening. It's how they just, they agreed to let me say 98% passing at all the time. So figure out what you want to measure and find some way of putting it on the wall. Don't let those facilities people get in your way. Figure it out. There's ways to do it. Um, and really understand the why behind the process. So we talk a lot about, um, you know, make the tests run green. Um, why do we have continuous integration? Understand why we're doing it. Why are we giving tests to the developers first? When you understand the why behind it, it will help keep that process going for a long time. And you can explain it to other people. And your retrospectives. Don't stop at the symptoms. Um, I just was at a, a team and, and the first day I went in and um, did a retrospective. So we ended up with all these symptoms and then I made them define their problem statements. We kind of grouped these symptoms and we defined the problem statements. We chose three and we defined acceptance tests for each of those problem statements and measurements and they were going to start putting them on the board because that's how you keep the process real and growing and improving. You have to make it visible and you have to understand what problem you're trying to, to solve. And the last thing is a learning mentality in your organization. So if you're running into the cultural issues um, that you're talking about or trying to sell it to a new customer, 
What is it you need to do? What kind of education can you do in your organization? Um, I was talking to one person at lunchtime today, and you know, her company gave her the day off to come to this, but she had to pay for it herself. So it's kind of, I was sitting there going, that's good. She wanted to, to learn something. Company met her halfway. Each of us is responsible for our own internal learning. But if you can bring it back to the, what you can do in your organization, if the organization learns and sets up things like lunch and learns, or, um, you know, you've got, because now we're all in different project teams. Each tester's in a project team. Instead of having a separate QA team, say, can we have a QA community? What can we do as a community? Can we have weekly lunch and learns so that uh, Rebecca can teach us how this new tool that she just learned, she's going to give us a, a little demo and share with the other groups, with the other testers. A learning organization is about the only way that you're going to keep it going. So think about what you can do to teach developers, to teach other testers, um, and anyone else that needs to be on a, in a learning organization. So whole team participation, absolutely critical for testers. If you're after the fact or sitting in another area and you're not part of that team, you're going to have a really hard time doing your job in an agile project because you have to listen to that conversation. You have to understand what's going on. You have to be able to ask those questions when you need to be asking them. Collaboration. One of the th I, I teach a, an agile testing course, and one of the things that we teach and, and really stress is how to collaborate with customers, with developers. How are we going to figure out what we're going to build? It's part of that whole team participation, but we don't learn those skills. It's not as easy as we think it is. You just, it's, you know, it's not where can we collaborate? So I always ask that. Would it have been easier if I would have talked to the developer earlier? Um, automate those regression tests. You can't automate them all. There's always going to be some regression tests. That's why there was a little fluffy cloud on top of that pyramid. Um, there's going to be some that don't make sense to automate. Too expensive, too hard, um, lots of different reasons. But you want to spend your time being critical, using your brains and doing exploratory testing. That's where you're going to find the cool bugs. So really try to get the rest automated. And if you can automate them up front in collaboration with the developers, it just makes your life easier. It's not easy. It takes time. Um, feedback. The earlier you give the feedback so the developers can actually fix the bugs when they, you know. If I can do, I call it a show me. So if my developer has, comes to me and says, Janet, you know, I'm finished coding this, this story. Can I show you? It's an opportunity to give him immediate feedback because I'll be sitting with him, letting him drive and show me what he's developed. Any bugs I find at that point in time, any bugs we find at that point in time aren't bugs. He's still in development mode. He can fix them. Immediate feedback. That's what we want to try to do. Um, you want to be involved. You want to understand what your architecture looks like. What are they coding? What changes are they making? You want to understand as much as you possibly can so you can test as well as you can. Never, 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 never get complacent. And try not to panic. I can't say don't panic because we all do that. When somebody comes in to your office and says, how come this isn't tested? You're going to panic if it's a VP. You just are. Step back and go, OK, what did he ask me to do? What can I do to solve that without compromising what we're trying to do? How should I respond versus react? So those are the things you can do and just keep thinking on a regular basis. So there's resources. Any questions? I've got about two minutes left. Yes, at the back. To incorporate the whole team in testing and always have a mindset of everybody should be thinking about testing on the team. Yep. But I just find that 
how can we really get that for those people to be interested in testing when that's not really their job? Um, but it is their job. So how do we get the rest of the team interested in testing? So every time I've asked this question, there were no developers here this morning. You're a developer. How much time do you spend testing? Uh, quite a bit of time. Quite a bit of time. Fifty uh, percent? Uh, feels like it, yeah. They do. That's, I, they do. Developers spend fifty percent of their time testing, period. So when they say they're not interested in testing, it's a lie. Because if they're doing, <laughs> now, but if, they, if they're actually doing their unit testing, if they're doing any kind of debugging and working, they're testing all the time. So they are. Just try to make it more visible. And, and one of the things in Agile is we talk about the whole team is committed to quality. So developers, they do test. Just make it visible and show them that they are and that they are you know, committed to it. Developers are the ones writing the bugs, guys. <laughs> and so part of my job as a tester is to help them not write those bugs. And by giving them the test first, they write fewer bugs. Fewer requirement bugs, right? Their unit test should be preventing the software bugs. Any more questions? One last question before I... All right. Well, I'm around for the rest of the day, so you can capture me and ask me any questions along the way. Thank you.